Hi folks. So we're back here today and uh, our last video touched upon using Ohm's law to determine what our voltage, current, or um, resistance is in a circuit. So now we're going to go into series circuits and show how to use Ohm's law to determine the various parameters of our series circuit. Uh, we'll go into parallel circuits after that. And we're going to have a uh, discussion about current flow as well because there is some disagreement in academic circles. And we're going to talk about what that is and why it doesn't really matter. So stay tuned. Okay, so here we have a schematic representation of a simple series circuit consisting of a power source and three resistors. Now, there's an axiom I was taught when we were in tech school, and it was this. Currents the same in a series circuit. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that anywhere we were to break this circuit and insert an ammeter, we would measure the same current because there is only one path for current to flow through. However, the voltages that we encounter are going to be different because we have these restrictions, these resistors in the circuit. Imagine if this was a water pipe with various restrictions, you would have a higher pressure on one side than the other. So too in electronics, when our um, electrons or our current flow through these resistors, they create what we call a voltage drop. And the higher the resistance, the higher the voltage drop is going to be. So I'm going to show you how we calculate the current and therefore how we can calculate the voltage drop. And of course, the uh, sum of all the voltage drops should equal the source. And I'll show you why it's probably not going to be exact, but here we go. Okay, so here's our circuit and here's our Ohm's Law wheel. Now we want to determine what the current flowing through this circuit is. And in order to do that, we're going to use the current quadrant of the Ohm's Law wheel. And we know our voltage, and we're going to add up all our resistances. So if we add up 1.2 plus 5.6 plus 4.7, we get 11.5 K ohms. So we're going to divide our voltage, which is 25, divided by 11.5 exponent 3 for K ohms, and that gives us a current of 0 0.00217 amps, or 2.17 milliamps. So we got a calculated current of 2.17 milliamps. All right, so we can then calculate what our voltage drop should be by using Ohm's Law. We want to calculate for our voltage. We need to multiply the current times the resistance. So, if we take 2.17 exponent negative 3, that gives us milliamps, times 1.2 exponent 3, for 1.2 K ohms, we get an expected voltage drop of 2.6. We do the same thing for the other two. We do 2.17 exponent negative 3 <coughs> excuse me, times 5.6 exponent 3 that gives us 12.15. And last we have 4.7, so it's 2.17 exponent negative 3 times 4.7 exponent 3. And that gives us 10.199, or we'll round that to 10.2. 
Okay, so if we add these together, plus 12.15 plus 2.6, we get 24,949 volts. And that's due to rounding errors. But you can see that the math works, and that's the whole point of this exercise. Now, we're going to hook up 25 volts to three resistors and measure them and see how close we get. Okay, so I got a power supply feeding out about 25 volts. It goes between 24.99 and 25, and I'm not going to screw with it until it's exactly right. But what we're going to check first is how close our current actually is to our calculated current. Now, in any situation, you could break a circuit and simply measure the current, but it's not practical when you're servicing a lot of electronic equipment. This is why we use Ohm's Law to calculate and extrapolate what these values are. So we have 25 volts, and I have three resistors of this value soldered together, and we're going to tape them up here. We're going to measure all this. But right now, let's see how close our current comes. So I feed one end of that to here, and then we're going to put our meter in current mode. And this is DC milliamps. And if we measure right at the end of our resistor string, we get 2.17, 2.18 milliamps. So our measured is very close to our calculated, 2.17. Yeah, call it 2.1. Yeah, we'll call it 2.17, 2.18. Okay. So now we're going to measure the voltage drops across each of these resistors and see how close they are to our calculated value. Okay, so I have three resistors of these values soldered together, and what do you know, they actually fell just about on the symbols. Didn't plan it out that way, but every once in a while you get lucky. So we wanna see how close we're gonna to get to our calculated voltage drops. So in order to do that, we have our meter in volts mode, and we're gonna go across each resistor and see how close we get to the values that we measured. Now we should have 25 volts going in, and we do. So our first resistor shows us 10.18. We calculated 10.2, so we got pretty close there. 10.18. Our next one, we calculated 12.15, and we got 12.2. Our last one, we calculated 2.6, and we get 2.59. Okay, so you can see that our measured values are very close to our calculated values. So why aren't they exact? Well, there's going to be a little bit of discrepancy because one of the parameters that you select when you buy resistors are your, is the tolerance. The tolerance is just how close it is to the exact value. Uh, it's usually specified as a percent. These are 1% resistors. Um, older resistors were 5%, 10%. You can get precision resistors. We don't generally need them, but in an experiment like this, this is why you're going to have a certain amount of discrepancy here. However, you can see that our calculated values fall very close to our measured values. Uh, the one that's furthest out, I'm going to say, is probably this one. And if we measure it, we'll see it's probably, well, it's not exactly 5.6. So let's see exactly what they are. I've turned the power supply off, so we'll go to ohms mode. Our first one is 4.7K, about 4.65. This one is 5.618, 
and the last one is 1.19 supposed to be 1.2 so you can see they're not exact but they're close just like our values that we calculated so in a series circuit the sum of the voltage drops should equal the output of the power supply or battery or whatever your power source is series circuits are pretty simple this way um, you may find yourself having to calculate what the voltage drops are when you're working on a stereo to make sure that you are getting the proper voltage at the base of a transistor there are several reasons we might want to do this um, your meter when measuring current has a shunt and the shunt is nothing but a precision resistor and as you run the current through there the volt me your meter actually measures the voltage drop that's the way an ammeter works now in large ac installations they do something a little different but in the central office environment in which i work we have batteries everything in a central office runs on dc volts we use rectifiers to keep the batteries charged but in the distribution bus bars you will see all the current in the dc plant runs through a shunt and that shunt will have a rating of say 800 amps equals 50 millivolts the 50 millivolts is full scale on an older analog meter um, and it's not unusual to have dc plants that are in the thousands of amps remember we're talking 48 volts and you need an appreciable amount of current to do any work but calculating voltage drops is a useful thing to know and remember this is a series circuit there is only a single path for current to run therefore currents the same in a series circuit that's an axiom in, in, in violet now we're going to have a little discussion now about which way current flows in the DC circuit. There's electron theory and conventional current theory. So I'm going to read you something about that and we're going to have a brief discussion about it. Okay, so when I was in electronic school, we were taught that current flowed from in a DC circuit from negative to positive we learned atomic theory we learned about electrons valence electrons blah 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 we're not going to talk about that however after leaving school and reading I, I read constantly it's the only way to really learn in my opinion um, I learned that there was a prevailing train of thought that also said current ran from positive to negative so before I did this article I mean this uh, series I, I've done a lot of reading brushing up because uh, my greatest fear is that I mislead anybody that kind of defeats the whole purpose of this channel and I found an excellent article uh, on an online publication called nuts and volts not bolts volts and it was written by Louis E Fresnel now, if you look up Louis E. Fresnel Jr., you'll see he's a very prolific author and has been writing books on electronics from the 70s. Um, and is considered an authority. And I liked what he said because it jived with things that I had learned over the years. Plus, he gave a little bit of history and background as to why this is, which I found interesting. So I'm just going to read you these. You can find this online. And this segment of his article says, Conventional Current versus Electron Flow. Scientists, engineers, college professors, and others have known for over a hundred years that current is really moving electrons. Yet they have continued to use the original positive to negative current flow model. This has come to be known as conventional current flow, CCF. Today, this concept is still widely used and almost universally still taught in science and engineering programs. It wasn't until the mid-20th century that electron flow was widely taught. This came about as a result of the massive training of electronic technicians during World War II. Didn't know that. 
Uh, the Army and Navy decided that electron flow was more appropriate than conventional current flow, so they developed all of their classes and training materials using electron flow. After the war, electron flow caught on and became the primary way of teaching technicians in community colleges, technical institutes, and vocational schools. Why the scientific, engineering, and academic communities refuse to change to electron flow is not known. It is likely that the feeling was that electrical theory was always taught using the conventional current flow model, and there was no particular need, desire, or reason to change. Change is difficult, and tradition dies hard. Thank you, Mr. F Fresnel. That, that was most illuminating. So. I'm going to teach it the way I was taught. You can read up, and uh, in the end, it doesn't matter. The most important thing here is consistency. I don't care if you use electron flow. I don't care if you use conventional current flow. It doesn't matter. The main thing is that you pick one and stick with it. That is the key, consistency. As long as you got one or the other, you'll be okay. I was taught that, I was taught electron flow. That's what I'm going to be discussing here. So we're going to discuss flow from negative to positive. Okay, so I was going to run into parallel circuits now, but this video is starting to run a little long. As I said in the past, I'm a fan of the shorter form videos, especially when we're discussing concepts which you may find unfamiliar. So I'm going to stop this one here, and the next one we'll pick up parallel circuits, and we'll have to learn about reciprocals when we do that. Uh, don't be afraid. It's okay. If I can do this math, you can do it. Today's calculators make it an utterly tri trivial exercise. So we're going to stop it here. As always, I thank everyone for watching and for all the, the wonderful, humbling the comments that you make. They are, I find them truly humbling, and I appreciate them deeply. I read all your comments and try to answer as many as I can. And now that I brought that up, I would like to ask you, if you have any questions, please post them. I try to answer all the questions, either by directly replying to you or answering them in the, in the following video. So thanks a lot, folks. And as always, I like giving back to the community that's given me so much. Have a great day.